Welcome to A Healthy Curiosity, the podcast that explores what it takes to be well in a busy world. With self-care strategies from Chinese medicine, functional medicine, Ayurveda, neuroscience, and beyond. I'm your host, Brody Welch, a licensed acupuncturist and transformation catalyst, here to support you on your journey of health, happiness, and personal evolution. Welcome to A Healthy Curiosity. I'm your host, Brody Welch, a licensed acupuncturist and a holistic transformation catalyst. And this one is for you. If you are a woman over the age of, let's go with 40, who cares about staying active and vital and independent in the second half of life. My guest today is Deborah Atkinson, who is a wellness coach and fitness expert who I had the pleasure of meeting on the set of The Dr. Nandy Show. We were both there being interviewed for a segment on simple exercise at any age. I was there chatting about Qigong, which for those of you who may not know, is a gentle exercise and moving meditation that comes from the Chinese medicine tradition and something that I teach. And Deborah was there as a fitness expert on exercise. Deborah helps women flip 50 maintaining the vitality and energy that they want in their second half of life. She's also a best-selling author of You Still Got It, Girl, The After 50 Fitness Formula for Women, Navigating Fitness After 50, Your GPS for Choosing Programs and Professionals You Can Trust, and Hot Not Bothered. Deborah hosts Flippin' 50 TV and the Flippin' 50 Podcast, which I was just delighted to be a guest on recently. And she has 35 years of experience in the fitness industry, all kinds of other credentials. Deborah, thank you so much for joining me today for this conversation. Thanks for having me. It's so good to talk to you again. And I was just thinking about how we met each other. Isn't it interesting how just you meet the right people at the right time? I absolutely love that and really trust that, that if we're we're walking the path that is ours to walk, that we meet the people who are supposed to be, who we're supposed to be involved with next. And just being clear enough to see that is the challenge. But yeah, I definitely got that resonance of just knowing that we're both trying to help women be happy, healthy, independent, vital, and coming at it from different angles. And I'm just super excited to pick your brain about what it is that, how we can do, be doing this, this countering normal quote unquote effects of aging, right? There's this prevailing thought form that you need to fall apart and your metabolism needs to slow down. And we just, that that aging is this whole process of, of deterioration. And you and I both know that that really isn't true. So I'm really excited to dive into this with you today. Yeah. So excited. You're getting my blood boiling a little bit. (laughs) Oh yeah. Why is that? Oh, just, you know, because those statements that you said, they're so true. That is almost the expectation. And when it is, it's a slippery slope because then if you buck that, you reject that, you're swimming upstream among so many other people who accept that it is the norm. And it's it makes it challenging for those of us to, who really want to and believe we can have the power to feel as young as we think. And I think that's the key. Absolutely. Because we both know from working with clients that there's a lot of different ways to look 80 or 70 or 50, (laughs) right? There's a lot of different ways. There's some people like I pull their chart and I have no idea how old they are at all because they've been looking the same for 10 years or or people who chronologically, uh, there's, there's a number there that just doesn't match how how quote unquote youthful they they present and and how much energy they have and how much creativity and vitality that they just exude. So so for somebody who might be struggling with that, who's who's saying, well, but isn't there isn't there some truth to that? Like doesn't our metabolism slow down with age? Let's let's convince that person that it doesn't have to. Okay, yeah, let's let's start with this that there's normal and then there's the word common. Mm -hmm. And I think we confuse the two. So it's very common that metabolism will slow down with age, but it has much more to do with our habits and choices. And not necessarily am I saying, well, it's your fault. By the way, if you're listening, that's not it because it's not your fault. We, We thought we were telling you the right thing to do. And 
we were using the best science possible, the best science we had in the moment, and you were using the best knowledge you had. But some of the things that we were taught 20 and 30 years ago, which may have been the time when they got locked into your head about this is the thing I should be doing, it doesn't work anymore. And actually, it's been replaced by better science. It's not just that it doesn't work in the hormone status you're in. It just simply really didn't work. We got lucky. If you didn't notice it until now, until hormones really rocked your boat and changed things, it's just that you were on this eight-lane highway, probably really busy, not paying quite as much attention. And now that you are, and things have changed a little bit more dramatically, it's just getting your attention and catching up with you. So what is perhaps the biggest or a couple of those top myths that people, that maybe people were taught that were, that we really need to update our files on? Absolutely. So number one is the first thing a woman will default to do and we are told to do is eat less, less and exercise, and exercize more. more. <laughs> right. So you can say that with me. That's because that's, that's it. And, and like often with shame, right? Like with doctors, you know, like looking oh, yeah. condescending and tisk tisking and mansplaining right. like, oh, well, if you just, you know, ate less and exercise calories in calories out. So what's wrong with that? Well, because the bottom line is, and, and I don't want to discount calories completely. So we can come back to that. Sure. But, but ultimately we have to first look at hormones control what you do with those calories. So we've got to really look at somehow the exercise is about creating hormone balance. That's ultimately the goal. It's not creating a wins and losses, pros and cons with, you know, calories in, calories out, and then you're just going to win because we know a calorie is not a calorie. We know chocolate cake versus a piece of salmon. If we had equal caloric amounts of both are going to sit on your body very differently. They're going to do very different things to hormones like insulin. And that determines fat storage and halts fat burning. So we know that to be true. We've got to really flip things around. And the messaging in the body is like this. If you eat less, you're actually telling your body, hey, burn less. Because that's what it does. You know, it goes way back in times when we had to forage for food and we kind of feasted or famined. Your body would store fat during those times when you weren't getting food and you were a caveman or you were stranded in the middle of winter. And that worked. But your body doesn't know the difference now that you're in modern America and there's a refrigerator 10 feet away or you could call Grubhub and have something in 10 minutes. It doesn't know that. And so if you're not eating on purpose or you're eating you know, very little lettuce and low calorie items to cut that calorie deficit or create it, cut down on calories you're actually just telling your body, hey, slow down, don't burn so much. So that, in effect, slows your metabolism. And we do more and more of that as we age in effort to revert to what worked for us at one time. And it worked at one time because when we were 25 or 30, even in our mid-30s, probably still worked a little bit, we were still at the peak of our muscle. At age 25, we peak in muscle. So we start losing it by little bits, but not noticeably. So by 30, we're starting to lose it, but we don't notice it. You know, we're busy and we're probably moving around whether or not you were exercising really, quote unquote, or you were just busy and moving a lot physically in your life. But then maybe at 35, you started to notice a little bit more. You put on a few more pounds. You go back to the class reunion and you notice everybody has put on weight, right? And then at 40 and at 45, you hit those landmark birthdays, the zeros and the fives. And that's when you tend to really kind of take stock and you notice, hey, this is really changing. But when perimenopause hits, then it's it's really bigger. And that cutting down on calories is stress to your body. So that contributes to more cortisol. And when you're a woman going through hormone chaos, when estrogen, testosterone, and progesterone are starting to wane, 
that also makes you more susceptible to negative stress effects of stress, more cortisol going in. So all of those things just are bricks in a backpack and that they're contributing more and more stress. And that will make your body store fat because again, it's trying to protect you. That's what it does. So our bodies are really just looking out for us, trying to make sure we don't starve to death, not understanding that we're, we actually live in with an abundance of calories, most of us. <laughs> and you mentioned that we, we start to, that we, our muscle it peak in our twenties and that we do start to lose it. Yeah. There's something we should be thinking about to prevent that muscle loss as we age. You should be thinking about more than thinking about it. Actually, you should be doing it. <laughs> Strength training. <laughs> So no matter who you are, if you've exercised for decades and then you've probably got more muscle than somebody else, but you can't outrun, you can't out Zumba strength training, those muscle losses will happen. And we've seen it in runners who are in their 50s and 60s who swear by running. That's all they ever did. They never did strength training. They're beginning to see more and more problems with bone density or fractures. So if they fall while they're on a trail or they miss a curb, we're seeing more bone fractures because they actually usually are lighter weight. And you wouldn't have seen very many obese people who have problems with bone density partially because they're carrying around weight with them. And that contributes to higher bone density, but it's someone who's thin or small, smaller in frame or frail as we get older. You've seen that happen with older adults and they become more prone to falls and fractures because not only do they lose bone density, but they're also losing that muscle mass that weakens them and makes their balance poor. So definitely strength training. There's no way around it, whether you're male, whether you're female, whether you're 20, you're 50, you're 90. We should all be, if we've got a heart rate, strength training. And when you say strength training, that to me conjures up images of being in a gym lifting weights. Is that to narrow a scope or is that exactly what you mean? Well, it's potentially it's a narrow scope. So you do have a lot of options, but my favorite and my personal professional opinion is that weights are best. So whether we're talking about machine weights or we're talking free weights, you're going to pick up dumbbells at home or kettlebells. And by the way, that there's no no mysterious magic about a kettlebell. It's just in a different shape. So you don't need to go get one. You know, you can do the same thing with dumbbells as you can with kettlebell pretty much. So those types of things, as opposed to bands and tubing, and those indeed are resistance training and they all fall under that umbrella. But the property of band and plastic tubing is so variant that we can't actually count on getting the overload we need throughout the whole belly of the muscle and the insertion and origin. So weights are a little bit better. And if you think about it, if you're you're picking up a baby, you're picking up a heavy box while you're moving, or you're bringing the eight plates down from the top shelf for Thanksgiving dinner, that really is much more like a dumbbell than it is a band. So we're really making it carry over to what you will be using it for in daily activities of living. But you can do that at home. You don't have to go to a gym to do it. Great. So are there ways that we might be thinking that we're helping ourselves through exercise that might actually be contributing to hormone imbalances? Great question. Yes. So I think kind of hand in hand with we started the first part of that phrase of, you know, eat less, exercise more. We learned long time ago to do more exercise and more was probably better whether we're talking more frequently, you know, three to five days a week, we were told to do cardio. That's still the American College of Sports Medicine's quota, if you will, for aerobic activity. And, you know, we learned that too well. Some of us, we, we really love exercise, some of us, and that's how we negate our stress. So we say, but we're also adding to it your body likes to be on the couch. So, you know, when you exercise, even a moderate kind that we should all be doing, it's a little stress on your body, which is okay. A little bit of good stress actually gives you energy. And that's what should happen is we should recover from it afterward and then it should be done. But unfortunately, so many of us will do 
kind of a moderate level, which is middle of the ground. It's not high intensity. It's not kind of all day intensity. It's right in the middle. And it's what I call the no benefits zone. It's kind of a level three on a one through five scale. And what we're doing is really wearing ourselves out, making ourselves tired. We're not doing a huge benefit for our hormone balance. And in that way, we're not helping our metabolism any. So that is basically, it's when we're not exerting ourselves at high intensity, Mm -hmm. we are, it's, we're just kind of like what, doing the same old tired workout that we've always done or like not doing it with particular, not really ourselves or like... Yep. And it's kind of a place where you are probably going out the door. You're doing that four mile walk at a brisk pace that you always do the same route, same time of day, probably. And it's just same old, same old. So number one, your body adapts to that. But you also, and and this could apply to anybody. So it's relative to what's what's normal for you. So maybe for you, it's a six mile run instead, or it's a getting on the elliptical and going for your 45 minutes. You know, if that's what you do every day and you work pretty hard, but not hard enough to say you get breathless ever, you're not doing those intervals of let's get breathless and then let's take a break really low. Let's get breathless and let's take a break really low. If you're not doing any of that or you're going hard so that you feel like you're really done, but not actually in that all day pace. So we we like actually the the all day pace that you can do and do outside can be much more beneficial kind of getting out into some green space which can do wonders for hormones as well, but you're not going to get that same effect on a treadmill in your basement. <laughs> okay? So that middle zone that is just there's no real purpose to it. The most hormone benefits are going to come when you do one or two times a week of high intensity interval training. You go to breathless for 30 seconds or a minute, and then you recover for twice as long. So if you've gone a minute in your interval, you're going to recover for, say, two minutes and or that's really light activity during that minute. And if you're doing kind of a long distance endurance activity, that might be that you're just go for a long bike ride with a friend or you're going for a long walk with a friend so you can talk easily, but you're doing something you really love. Maybe it's a hike, you know, on a trail. So a hike for a couple of hours outdoors, very hormone balancing. Now you may not get breathless, but that's okay sometimes. And when you say hormone balancing, what do you mean by that? I mean, the exercise that you choose can either take your cortisol way off the charts and way too high. It can be very, very much too little to actually do any good cortisol, or it can use it the way it should be and help optimize your cortisol level. So your exercise choice really puts things in its place. So it's not just a matter of, well, you need to exercise. It's huh, I need to think about how I need to exercise right now. So really pushing the limit. If you think about how we were meant to use stress, you know, when you would give a speech, you're supposed to be a little nervous before you get on stage, right? It means that it matters to you. It means that I've practiced enough and and I'm keyed up enough so that I've got the energy to have enthusiasm when I get out there on stage and I go. But if you're if you're just like flatlined, <laughs> it's probably not going to be a very engaging speech and the audience is going to be a little sleepy. You know, if you are so hyper on the opposite end, you may just totally forget your lines and blank and just be miserable out there. And so will the audience, by the way. But it's like playing violin. You have to have tension in the string, right, to have beautiful music. If you have too much tension, that string's going to break. If you don't have enough, you don't have really good music. You're not going to be able to play it. So it's optimizing the right level of stress if we're talking about cortisol or optimizing the right hormone level no matter what kind of exercise 
we're talking about. So let's talk strength training helps to optimize testosterone levels. And even women have a lower level of testosterone to begin with, but we need it. We need that little bit because it's the perfect amount for us. But if we get lower than that as we go through perimenopause or beyond, that can be problematic. We lose our libido and we lose kind of that being in charge, like speaking up, speaking our mind. If you're in a, a boardroom, you know, and you're at that conference meeting and you don't agree with something, it's the thing that lets you speak up and say, I don't agree with that. So we need it and weight training can actually help, but it's not weight training for hours. It's weight training with intensity. So you reach fatigue at the end of a set and that could take as little as 10 minutes to do a high quality strength training workout. This episode of A Healthy Curiosity is brought to you by my five-day Qigong challenge, or mini class, because really, who needs another challenge in their lives? Qigong is about breathing and moving mindfully. It can help you feel calm, centered, energized, focused, and peaceful, as well as being useful for a whole host of health conditions. I've created super short, simple videos to introduce you to Qigong, yoga's less sexy, less popular cousin who is wildly underestimated. You can do Qigong anywhere with no special equipment and no stretchy pants required. Visit my website, brodywelch.com forward slash explore and sign up for this five day Qigong mini class that you can do in just five minutes a day. Again, that's brodywelch.com, brody with an IE and welch with a CH forward slash explore. I love that you're bringing up this idea of like the Goldilocks zone, right? Of not too much, not too little of of cortisol or of like exercise that's going to potentially, uh, that we want that sweet spot, right? That, uh, that in Chinese medicine, we think about cortisol is the, is the hormone that, uh, well, it, in, in general, cortisol is the hormone that takes us into fight or flight, right? That makes us, that keys us up. It gets, it's very young. It's very activating, moving. It's about giving us the strength that we need to fight or flee. And testosterone, also a very young hormone in the sense that it gives us that, that upward, outward energy that we would need to to stand up for ourselves, to to be decisive, to be leaders, but also to have desire, right? To have libido. If you're if you if you don't have any of that upward outward energy, if it's, your energy is kind of flat or downward or inward, you're you're not going to do a whole lot. And so, it, ideally, we want our exercise to activate these hormones, not deplete them because we know that yin changes into yang and yang changes into yin. So if you if you like are doing su- something super intense for a super long time, then yeah, it is depleting and ultimately it's going to have the opposite effect that you would want. So so really that you know that idea of pulsation between activity and rest or between working out and stretching out or between even just sleep and activity that paying attention to that in our daily lives and clearly but well, the, the way our society is set up is that most of us are doing way too much. And so it's the kind of thing where like, if you're, if you're already depleted and kind of exhausted, making sure that your exercise program is not further depleting you should be a really important consideration. So well said. Yes. Love everything that you said and the way that you illustrated that was perfect. And that's exactly right. And I think there is a time when you maybe should exercise less than less, right? So restore before more is one of the very first kind of mantras at Flipping 50. So before we're going to look at what kind of exercise should you be doing, we look at should you be doing any right now Mm -hmm. first? So in many of the programs that I do, the first week for everyone is just let's do a reset because sometimes if you're you're working out and you would love to work out you actually need this as much as someone who's just tired you need to quiet things down and so I'll have people just walk you know or their equivalent of walking if if joints don't permit that maybe it's bicycling or or something else smooth and easy and it's just a quota of or or reaching something under a quota. They don't have to reach quota. They just need to go for what to them is a longer-ish walk. No special pace or, or distance, but it's just walking. And it's just to, for that week, get in better touch with 
what else is happening during the day for me? Am I hungry? Am I thirsty? Am I tired? And let's start taking care of those needs and start listening again to really what's happening. And maybe if we fill that cup and we fill that hole up, we can begin to build on that foundation, but we can't dig you deeper into the hole and expect you're going to get more energy if you're already tired and then we add more to it. I really appreciate you saying that because I for mm-hmm. I am one of those people who loves to exercise and I it's it's how I can access a feeling of relaxation. A lot of times it's how I shift gears between being in clinic and going home to my family. But there are there are have been days where I've noticed that I'll start, especially if I'm in an exercise class after work, where I'll literally start yawning in the middle of class. And from from a Chinese medicine standpoint, yawning is like, give me more chi, give me more energy. And so I just, and and for me, it was like red flag raising in terms of like, should I even be here? Is this a good idea? Like maybe I should be doing something more gentle. Maybe I should be doing some qigong to actually be building my energy as opposed to expending it and it's a it can be a hard thing if like if if the way that we typically if our default mode is yang to create something more yin a, a slower pace a, a gentle walk a, a form of like a gentle yoga or a gentle qigong class that could be actually the medicine that we need <laughs> so love that two things come to mind with you saying that so it's a great reminder one is i love the 10 minute rule you know, and that's a good way. If you just can't tell, should I do this? You're playing that guilt game. You're thinking if I don't exercise, I feel guilty or I feel behind. Mm-hmm. You know, 10 minute rule will often tell you, meaning go ahead and start. So you've done pretty much that's the warm up, maybe a little bit more. But if you, if this is a day when you should be exercising and you're going to benefit from it, by that 10 minute point, you will feel like I've, I've got my energy back. This is exactly what I needed. And if it's a day when, nope, nope, this, I really am feeling tired, like this is drudgery, then probably you're better to not exercise and get some rest, do something else, or read a book, take a nap, just skip it, be good to yourself. And, and don't let work fill that time, by the way. <laughs> but, and the other thing is, one of the ways that I ask people to reflect on, you know, are they doing the right thing for them, especially people who are kind of flirting in adrenal fatigue, whether or not you, I'm not sure if Brody, you talk about adrenal fatigue as that, or you talk about HPA access instead. But if you could lie down and take a nap right after your exercise, then you're doing too much. Really good rule to remember. So for those people who are listening who are like, all right, it sounds like they're just letting me off the hook. Like, what what do I actually need to be doing? Um, if I want to get the most bang for my buck, I want to optimize my life. I want to just fit in the, the best possible hormone balancing workout for me. And I've done this, I've done this get in touch with myself, slow down thing. What what else should I be focusing on? Well, here's the here's the quota. Ultimately, if you are feeling good, you're feeling like, okay, I'm good. I feel that my holes, I'm rested, I'm ready to go. Here's what I'd love for you to try. Two weight training workouts a week. Two, not three. Not three, just two. Three. Okay. More yeah. is better. More is better, but more better is better, right? <laughs> so so it's just, we want to make those two more effective. And what what we tend to find happen is when people do three, they actually leave it at the gym instead of remembering. I mean, what's the reason we work out? So life gets better, life outside the gym. It's not about getting better at the gym. It's about what can you do outside? So studies of actually perimenopausal or menopausal women have proven that total caloric burn or energy expenditure, and that's not always the focus, but is higher in those who do two time a week workouts because they optimize their strength and their stamina and endurance such that they still have enough energy left over that they're doing more all day every day. I mean, they're inclined to say, oh, I'm going to go up and down the stairs a couple more times and do a couple more loads of laundry. I'm going to I'm going to go outside and play with kids. I'm going to take the dog for the little bit longer walk. You know, and they just have that much more life activity. 
And Mayo Clinic long ago did a study looking at what's the correlation between, say, disease and obesity and activity level. And it had much more to do with our neat non-exercise activity time, those times when we're not on a treadmill or going for a run or lifting weights, but the lifestyle activity. And so even people who are working out, if they didn't be active the rest of the day, they were more prone to be obese. And the people who were active all day, but didn't necessarily work out actually had a lower rate of obesity. That reminds me of that study of housekeepers who were told that yeah. like, you know, like just their mindset about the fact that what they're doing is actually burning a lot of calories, that they actually lost weight. Whereas the group that didn't think of their work as a, as like effectively a workout didn't, <laughs> which I thought was really interesting about the role of the mind. It is so interesting. I love it. Ellen Langer and Alicia Crum did that study back in 2007. Not all that long ago, really. And I tell you what, so secret to all your listeners, I'm interviewing Ellen in a couple of weeks and she's oh, like nice. in her 70s. So, so excited about that. Awesome. But yeah, they split them up and they told, you know, all of them how important physical activity was for decreasing the risk of disease and all the good things that exercise does, you know, weight loss, optimal blood pressure, cholesterol, and all of it. And then they separated them and they told half the group, you are actually active enough. What you do every day, cleaning eight rooms a day is enough activity to count. So all of these benefits are probably yours. And they came back in four weeks nothing had changed about their physical schedule. They were doing exactly the same. They didn't change eating for either group, but the group that now was thinking what they were doing counted, had lost weight, lost body fat, improved their blood pressure and cholesterol. Crazy. Oh, I right? love I love that you knew exactly the study I was trying to call up from memory because it's like and I know. I was like, like had we talked about yeah, that? No, we actually haven't, but <laughs> <laughs> but I remember being really floored by that idea of mindset. And we were chatting about mindset right before we hopped onto the recording. And so just that and 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 also just the idea that well, a couple of threads that I wanted to pick up. One is this idea that intermittent movement throughout our lives, that uh, mm -hmm. that movement that we enjoy is really important and, and not sort of ghettoizing our workouts as this like one silo <laughs> of, you know, something that I do. And then the rest of the time, I don't have to think about having a body because it's really right. about embodying it, being present within our bodies enough to listen to the fact that our bodies really don't like sitting all that much. And, you know, or that oftentimes yeah. that if, if we listen and we're clued in, we'll know that we're going to have a better day if we put our arms up over our heads and yawn and stretch and get down on the floor and twist or, you know, walk on, walk outside in the grass and bare feet or, you know, whatever it is that the animal parts of who we are, that, you know, that our intuition that lives in our physical form, it has a knowledge that if we give it permission instead of instead of wondering like what the latest science is telling us it's like we it, a lot of times it can just be what we're tuned into in ourselves and and having enough energy and bandwidth to pay attention to that i think is really important agree so agree with that and just another case in point so i am and have loved endurance exercise for a long time. Now, the after 50 fitness formula for women does not agree with this, by the way. So let me tell you, don't, don't try this at home <laughs> necessarily. Mm -hmm. But I've trained for Ironman distance triathlons, which are grueling all day kinds of events, at least when you're an age grouper like I am. So I'm not going to finish before dark for sure. But I've trained at different times and there were and instances where I trained and, and that's kind of all I did. And there's another instance where my son was going through a period of time where he was getting recruited. We were going to a lot of golf tournaments to get him recruited for college. So as a golf mom, you know, I dutifully, you know, followed along after, and that meant sometimes 18 holes, sometimes 36 holes. And some of those golf courses are six or seven miles long by the time you do 18 holes. So that's, uh, those are long days. And yet it was that 
you know, cause that's not a fast walk. You walk, 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 and then you wait, wait, wait. <laughs> right. And so it has nothing to do with heart rate at all. And you have to stay far enough behind that you don't make your golfer nervous and all of that. But it was the summer when I was walking and following him and, and loving it. You know, I had lots of memories of my stepfather and I golfing together. And so it was just like a legacy thing and being outdoors. And it was, it was so great. I was so happy. And I was never in better shape. So comparing training for six different Ironman, that was the one uniquely that stood out because because there was much more low level walking and outdoor exercise while I was doing it. That is fascinating. What a what a compelling anecdote to share that really brings it home. Before I let you go, as I know we're getting close to time here, how can a woman know that she is on the path to better results even if she's not seeing the scale changing? Great question. Lots of little things that you've got to trust in. So just beginning even to have more energy during the day, feel like you're more alert and definitely sleeping better. So most of the women listening probably can identify with this, but a lot of women in their late 40s to anywhere in their 60s or or even 70s, some of my clients will say they've got trouble falling asleep, staying asleep, or waking too early. And hopefully you're not checking all three boxes. <laughs> That's not the recommendation. But improving in that, you know, feeling like you're sleeping deeper, that when you wake up in the morning, you're more rested. You may surprisingly be sleeping fewer hours. You may still be waking early, but you're feeling like you're done, like it's okay. Your appetite will improve. And by that, I mean both sides. You will have more appetite. So a lot of women I'm noticing are actually complaining they're really not hungry. They've, they're dealing with a lot of bloatedness, and so they really don't get an appetite for a meal. We're all kind of conditioned that we start eating at a certain time, but they don't really have a good appetite like they should. So that, but also not feeling cravings. They finish a meal and they're feeling satisfied no ups and downs as far as blood sugar goes. And that really relates to energy again. But those little changes of my clothes are feeling better, even they're fitting a little bit better around my waist, those things happening or inches lost, even if the scale doesn't budge, I'll tell you, you are on the right path, girlfriend. Awesome. That's, that's I think, really important to, to know. And especially because the scale isn't really the best metric anyway, right? Like we're not living our Jeez. lives to make numbers move around. <laughs> Here's a bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Deborah, if people are interested in learning more from you or staying in touch, how could they best do that? Everybody can find me at flipping50.com and you can do either flipping50 or flipping50 all spelled out.com now. And there's lots of ways you can connect and find the resources that you need. So if you're looking for a little exercise push just to share with your listeners, flipping50.com forward slash five, the number day flip. And I'll send you five short, easy to do videos and we'll do a little cardio and a little strength training right in your living room. Awesome. I'll make sure that that gets into the show notes. Deborah Atkinson, thank you so much for joining me for this educational and empowering conversation. Thanks so much for having me. It was great to talk to you. Thanks for listening today. To check out the show notes, get on my email list or drop me a line head to brodywelch.com. That's Brody with an IE and Welch with a CH. I'd love to hear from you. If you learned something new or feel inspired to try something different in your life, I'd love for you to pay it forward by sharing this episode with a friend you think could also benefit and give them a reason to listen. You'll be helping to create a world where we encourage each other to embody self-respect. Till next time, be good to yourself.